come with us now, if you dare, down a rickety staircase into a dank, dark basement. What awaits the Saturday Night Freak Show? <laughs> Hello, and thank you for listening to the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast. We're a weekly movie podcast where we don't necessarily review movies. What do we do? We sit around and we talk about movies. We watch a movie. We talk about that movie, plus other things that remind us of that movie. There you go. That's a pretty good description (laughs) right there. Uh, But you can find us on uh, iTunes, uh, Google Play, uh, Stitcher Radio, TuneIn Radio, wherever you found us. We hope that you'll take a moment to go and write us a review, leave a comment, or uh, give us a thumbs up, thumbs down, star rating, because all these things help us get discovered by other people like yourself out there. So spread the word, Saturday Night Freak Show. Uh, These are the internet radio superstars. Sean. Holly. Michaela. And I'm Colin. And tonight we watched a movie that was chosen by... Colin. What did we watch tonight on the Saturday Night Freak Show? Tonight we watched a movie called Beyond the Black Rainbow. Directed by who? Pinos Cosmetos. Any relation to the George P. Cosmetos that directed Cobra? It is. It's his son. Ah. Check out our past Shit. episode on Cobra, guys. Different yep. styles of filmmaking yeah. these two possess. You think very so? different? <laughs> Maybe I'd say very much. This from yeah. 2011, but it thinks it's uh, 1983. It does indeed. Yeah. Uh, How did you first become aware of this movie, Colin? Trailers, just trailers. Yeah, I think I remember you showing me the trailer for this movie because mm-hmm. I remember uh, Arboria. Yeah, I remember. Is that part of the trailer? Him mm-hmm. talking. Okay, I've seen the trailer for this. You've showed me. Yeah. Because I remember him, that part. Yeah, because before A24 was uh, doing all these, like, sci-fi, horror, you know, odd independent movies, Mm -hmm. there was Magnet releasing. Mm -hmm. I think, like, Gone? I don't see a lot. I see uh, nothing from them, yeah. So uh, maybe somebody bought them out. Yeah, for a while. Well, they were, like, a subdivision of uh, Magnolia. I don't Mm know. I haven't seen those guys around. But they were, for a while, like, putting out all these kind of interesting and odd off-the-beaten-path, like, uh, film festival acquisitions. Mm, Yes. I guess that's how you'd call it. No, that's A24. Um, So, as I said, this movie takes place in 1983. But that's not good enough for this movie. No. It wants you to believe that it was made in 1983. Mm-hmm. So there's a, uh, what would you call this? Like retro wave? Nostalgia wave? I would say more retro wave. What is it? I get no nostalgia from this movie. No, none. But you'd say that perhaps the person who made it had nostalgia for the year? I would say so, yes. <laughs> or not for this, the year, for the era. I, I want this guy to make an alien movie because that's kind of feels like that era from back in the day. Like I like to see his aesthetic put into an alien movie. I think that'd be interesting. Did you see other film references in this movie? No, maybe Um, you didn't. No, I've seen like direct, like, uh, quotes. I saw saw movies. I've seen movies that may have seen this movie before since 2011. Yeah. Do tell ex machina. You're saying in the set design. I say, yeah, in the set design, in the lighting, um, even I'm, I'm not not really story wise though, and I don't think they really connect except for the the woman kept kind of underground in in, in this experimental place that that all these characters inhabit. That's about the limit of that. And the look an evil of it, scientist or somebody yeah. who's keeping her there, right? I see those connections. Well, that's like a standard but sci-fi thing, movie yeah. trope, kind of the uh, you know the experiment and the doctor mm-hmm. or whatever that because uh, yep. those are the two primary characters in this movie. You saw like the set design, everything. I got a definite Kubrick two thousand one feel, and I also got an Empire Strikes Back feel mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah, yeah. I initially thought that in the set design, like the like like two thousand one for sure. But I backed off of it because none of the cinematography was anything close to like Kubrick cinematography. Cinematography, no, but but the, the set the design, feel of yeah. the set design definitely. Mm-hmm. And yeah, for sure, Empire, especially the like the um, like the duct scene looking down. Mm-hmm. I got I got oh, a definite yeah, feel yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. picked yeah, a lot. Picked up a lot of Empire. You ever played a video game called Portal? Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah a little bit here and yeah. there. Yeah. You know, I think a, Portal 2. 
That's where I played. Uh, okay, I think it's maybe in the first portal uh, where you know you play as a subject being tested in an mm-hmm. underground uh, laboratory, and at some point you escape. And behind the you know white paneled uh, walls of the the testing facility, there's these kind of you know duct work and and pipes and uh, electronic you know or uh, wires all run yeah. and all that stuff. And I was like, so I got like a vibe of that. Isn't there a thing in that game where it's just like the something is not real or uh, what the, the, the cake is the cake is not real. The cake is not real. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> and Glados the, uh, the yeah. AI. That, yeah, yeah. But I saw like I mean there was references in there to the movie Akira. In oh, Akira, I didn't see really. Well, there's a character. Well, that's why maybe I'm I'm reaching. I don't know. But when I mean, I, I haven't seen Akira in a while. But there's a scene where, um, well, it's about a, a guy who's got these telekinetic abilities. And at one mm-hmm. point, he blasts this guy in a hallway and like splatters his brains all over the wall. Mm-hmm. It's like a pretty cool scene where the guy just goes, Poof, and he's all over everything. And there's a scene in this where our protagonist, the girl, like uses her telekinetic abilities to like blow somebody's. Um, Face yeah, yeah, basically. Do some kind of hemorrhaging effect, like scanners or something. So scanners yeah. is like Cronenberg. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's uh, some Blade Runner. There's uh, somebody poking somebody else's eyes out. I was like... Which is also a Salvador Dali movie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Sheena and Delui is that famous the, eyeball yeah. scene. Yeah. But do they mm. poke with the thumbs? That's Game of Thrones. <laughs> That's Blade Runner. And Blade Runner. And there was several parts of those I, I was thinking, and I even said to Michael at one point, I was like, this is very Salvador Dali. Mm-hmm. Uh, very like just the feel of it. I think maybe the melting stuff. Uh the uh okay, so well, I mean yeah. this is the other question. Is this a psychedelic movie? No. 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 I don't think so. No, when I, I wish think I was about on it. psychedelics while watching this movie. Yeah. Would that have, would yeah. that yes. I feel like the... it's too slow for psychedelics. It's so slow. Like when I think about other trippy movie trippy movies, like they're, they're fast. so much faster yeah. paced. Yeah, I feel like movie. I would get lost in this movie yeah. and just mm-hmm. like be there forever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If I took drugs and watched this, I'd be <laughs> yeah. like, No <laughs> And just be stuck. Yeah, yeah, I think this would scare you mm-hmm. on psychedelics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think it would because I don't think there's enough of anything there to really like you think about like Jacob's Ladder, Altered States or, you know, Zardoz, like those have so much more happening in them than this movie does. But what about like uh, I just remember, you know, my acid days, it was Pink Floyd, The Wall or something like that. That is a lot more happening, too, for sure. I mean, the pace is pretty slow in that, too, but. Right, but it's a, a movie of, I guess, like the the music provides like this atmosphere kind of. I mean, you know that. Yeah. Kinda, the but that was created by musicians. This wasn't. So yeah, like the music. Like, I don't think they're comparable. The music in, in that. that way. There was hardly any music in this. Well, there's a tonal soundscape, I guess. Yeah. Right? It's mm-hmm. like that's what they're kind of going for. There's <laughs> a musical. I don't know if it's a group. It's a musical project called Sononia Caves. Which is actually this guy, I think he's like a keyboardist for some band called Black Mountain, which I confess I've never heard of, but uh, he does the soundscapes for this. So there's a, a bunch of, see, again, what would you call this? This is kind of like synth, it's synth wave yeah. or something like that. It's like, you know, filtering Tangerine Dream, John Carpenter, you know, all of these kind of things through like a blender and then saying, here's, you know, presenting this. And then uh, just pouring it on its audience, just. Yeah, but I mean, like a David Lynch movie, I just got done watching the, you know, Twin Peaks, The Return, where like the soundscape and the sound design and like the mood of the whole thing is like, you know, the sound effects, you know, are in, integral to the experience mm. of watching the thing. Like, yeah. uh, you know, like this one has like a drone, you know, the drone, I guess, right? This yeah. is another like uh, a staple of these type of movies. The drone, which we find out at some point, it, like it permeates the entire sound track of the movie but eventually we find out that it's uh this um triangle in the basement of the facility Mm -hmm. that that's the influence of this like psychic dampening machine yeah that they have built in the basement that keeps the psychic girl upstairs in her room from escaping yeah you've uh you watched david lynch you watched twin peaks and you just saw mother you're just in the mood for some surrealist shit right mm-hmm. now aren't you you're just on yeah, that always oh that's very true you always. Know, i mean that's kind of the you know i mean I, I was just thinking about this so like i'm drawn to these type of movies i think because not that i prefer them over you know your marvel movie or whatever but like there's only so much of that stuff that you can see and eventually mm-hmm. it's like well you know what else are these other people doing it's this kind of experimental 
uh, filmmaking technique where they're trying to do something that's like just with the image alone. Here's, but I mean, this is the thing, I guess. <clears throat> is this a thing that you're seeing more of where movies take what used to be, you know, or what's commonly accepted as like a standard three act story structure that has a bunch of scenes and a bunch of dialogue. And then they're going like, well, what would happen if we took out most Anything of the dialogue? Sense. And what happens if we take out like every other scene or whatever, you know, mm. I mean, you know, what does that do to the way that you experience the movie? I guess I have a suggestion. I'm curious what you <laughs> it alienates your audience. Does it? <laughs> I well, think I mean, so. I, guess, I mean, if that was your experience. I yeah. mean, yeah, I just think that you take out these things that are kind of taken as essential to movie making. Yeah, you're going to lose some stuff. And that's not to say we're not willing to go on uh, a journey that a filmmaker wants us to go on. But there is like there's I mean, there's obviously a certain language of film that, you know, your audience can follow that You're if saying you like take a too visual much language. A, a visual yeah i guess a visual language that if you take enough of it away i think like michaela said you, you alienate them or you lose them like you're just this little building blocks that help it you know uh, help your movie work and if you take you can take them away or rearrange them and do stuff with them but if you take too much away I think it just leaves your audience going, uh, okay. I think it does something to your audience where, or at least it like, you know, did to me. Where it's just like, um, all right. Why? It doesn't give them a reason to invest in it. You know, why? like if you take away so much that it's just like this bare bones structure, why does anyone, why does your audience care at that point? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Why am, why am yeah. I watching this? Just to, just mm -hmm. to, do they just want us to feel something? Not necessarily understand what we're seeing. Did you not understand what you were seeing? What's the story of this movie? Well, I mean, they I mean they start out. Movie starts out with it feels like um, a video by Doctor What Mercurio Arborea, mm -hmm. and so he's basically it's like the introduction video to a program you're going to start about how they've discovered ways to. Um, I guess they found the perfect way to induce happiness in people and contentment and what have you. This is like, uh, what would you say? Like, it's very hippie ish. Like, 1966, oh. I think, is when it's made, right? So, this it's is very Dianetics. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it really is. It is. Yeah, it really is. If you're going to use energy sculpting yeah. and benign pharmacology, you know, <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, it starts out with that. Uh, what was your question? What was the point of my... Well, I was like, just... What, what is it about? What is it about? Because yeah, 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 yeah. you were saying... <laughs> the age-old question. If you take these <laughs> these building blocks out of a film structure, are you yeah. still left with something that you can follow? Yeah. Like, does the story still play in a strictly, almost visual yeah. uh, film, like, you know, through visual storytelling? Right. I mean, you could... So, I guess that's why I was just curious, like, what your take on the movie... You know, like, what was it about? Like, condensed... If you take out if you take out the like the plot and storytelling narrative and it's just a visual kind of element, then it's just an art installation. It's not a movie at that point. At that point it's a piece of video art. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. For yeah. sure. Because I mean I'm sure there's strands you can follow. Like and maybe the uh what was her name? The girl. Elena. Elena. Maybe she was that it doesn't explain for the psychic power. Maybe she was there as part of and I'm just all basing this off that video at the beginning because that that's what they first show us. So there's got to mm -hmm. be some strand of that, that the place she's in is the place that obviously does that. Yeah, the Arborea Institute. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, because obviously the guy who I, I don't remember him, but his name in this movie, who's the guy with the eyeballs? And the uh, leg? Barry. Barry. Barry, yes. Barry Nile. Yes, the doctor, Barry. Yeah. Uh, seems to be. Um, uh, I mean, he's obviously part of the program. He's studying the stuff that Arboria has done. Arboria is there in some room somewhere. So obviously, it's maybe she's taking part in that program. And she's like experienced like what they have said they can do. Mm. But it kind of puts her into a state of uh, uh, she doesn't speak throughout the entire movie, I believe. Right. It's a state of like she does at one point. She speaks. Uh, I don't think she verbally does she speak like through um, telepathy. Yeah. Yeah. Because she says, I want to see my father. 
Yeah. Do you remember the scene in the? Uh, so there's a there's a flashback. I guess it also takes place. This takes place late in the movie, but it kind of gives context to what's been going on in the in the story, where Barry uses some type of uh, hallucinogen. Mm-hmm. Administered by the the staff there at the Arborea Institute and mm-hmm. like uh, dissolves I mean his consciousness and then he's <laughs> reborn and when he does he attacks Elena's mother who's like a I can't tell if she's Arborea's wife that's what it kind of feels like but maybe not because who's Elena's father it's either Barry Nile or Arborea himself and then together they dunk the baby into that the same they give the baby the same treatment so she and barry both go through the uh psychedelic is that our is that elena's mother i think uh, it feels like arborea is the the father but i don't think this is explicitly stated in the movie so it's what you take out of it i guess but they seem to be the only people there so Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. safe bet why are they the only people there and why is it's Barry? an institute? Mm-hmm. And what is? And there's well, there's one nurse, I guess. So she's the only right. other person. And some on really the staff. tall alien dudes <clears throat> with creepy baby faces. <laughs> the Tron guys. Are, yeah, that's like a nod to the black hole too. It's like when I'm seeing that, I'm like, this is the black hole, right? All the guys wandering around. But anyway, the Disney movie, nobody, the no. black hole. Um, but what? Who? What? What? What is Barry? What is Barry? He just a. Uh, uh, a thing like he's a, is he a deformed person like he's got the he, he, he has the lizard eyes the, he's got the yeah. lizard eyes yeah. he's got the the, the the wig his what does she the call sticky him? wig his, uh, why is it a sticky wig it's so it's gross. Gross. you glue that's a wig on your head <laughs> like that scene grossed me out more than anything is else that what wig glue is like it's all sticky and stringy oh yeah he's yeah. been he's been hot all day and that's so true. it's all oh, is that what it is it's not the glue that's just like oh no that's like the because the sweat and the glue yeah it's like melted glue pull it off and everything yeah like, well, yeah, but what is he? With those well, he's a he's a, he's a a deformation of some sort. Like, but why is he in? Why is he doing things? Like, why why is he in charge of things? <laughs> why is he doing? Why is he doing things? things? <laughs> like, why is he left to do things? Like, I have an idea, but okay. I mean, what do you think? He was his apprentice. Is my guess? Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I feel like there's some relation there. What happened to Doctor Arborea? Like, he's obviously degenerated to a certain point where he's just kind of he's like in a, a method room. or like a heroin addict. Basically, at, some point, at this we point, we see a bunch of needles, and he, you know, Barry gives him his final injection. Yeah, and he's and like, he's like he's euphoric. Yeah, to yeah. the great by and by. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I get the idea that the the whatever happened to Barry in the um. Th- through his trip, right? Uh-huh. Like that left him both mentally, emotionally, and physically altered. Mm. And this is why he shows up late. We don't know this at the beginning of the movie, and this is like the you know, like a third act reveal. The uh, you know that he has no hair. He's got lizard eyes, and you know, I don't know. The you know, he's crazy. He's got like one arm's weird. <laughs> yeah, he's got like claws or something. I think that yeah. was the glove or whatever. That it, he yeah, wearing. but it seems like there's like fingernails and within there somewhere, and mm-hmm. one arm's covered and the other one's not. I think he's projecting this kind of like mask of humanity through the first half of the movie, where he's still trying to uphold the uh, because Doctor Arboria is there and represents yeah. some type of authority, even though he's not you know, actively participating in the the Institute because now it's basically left up to Barry to run it. Mm -hmm. Uh, He's, he knows who Elena is, you know, that she basically is like him shared this, uh, this experience where he believes this makes you uh, more than, you know, a a regular person. He saw the eye of God and now he sees through things and he's had, you know, the third eye opened or whatever. Is that his wife? The chick sleeping on the couch? Barry's wife or? Is that Barry's wife? Did you take it that way? Kinda. That's how I see it, but that's what it feels like. What was? I mean, a lackadaisical relationship that that is. I don't know what her purpose was other than be like, I never see you this way. Uh huh. I was meditating all day. (laughs) That actually was kind of funny. He just seems very. I was meditating. That's something my dad would say. He's like, I was just resting my eyes. Yeah. I wasn't sleeping. It was very yeah. The guy has like an interesting way of. a, perform- a delivery his of physicality his physicality and everything because you know it's not one of those other you know things where like you sit there and at least I do this sometimes especially in, in movies like that where you sit there and go like how was that line written 
Yeah. And the way that he delivers it, it's like, okay, I'm just going to deliver this like I hate you. Yeah. But yeah. all the lines don't necessarily say that. No. Yeah. It's just the way that he's saying it. He's like so fucking tired of being there and having mm-hmm. to deal he with really talking is. to people. <laughs> you know what it reminded me of? You guys look at this. Um, it reminded me of that episode of The Office when Dwight goes to New York and he says he went to the dentist. He's like... Your dentist's name is Crentis? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and he's like whispering he's like, yeah. all his lines very like, hushed. He, yeah. He's not blinking. He's like, what's his name? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Your dentist? Crentis. Those are Crentis. interesting yeah. actor choices, right? Like, You're yeah. like, why did you do it that way? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, why, yeah, what was that motivation to just be like, ah. Because mm-hmm. it just feels like he's, uh, it feels like he's faking. I think, I think that's the point. Yeah. That is the point. Yeah, right? that we he's find just, out later that he is he's, like. He's literally putting on a face. Yeah. <laughs> and some hair and some eyeballs and all that, so. Mm-hmm. Mm. So he's trying to get in touch with her somehow or to maximize her potential because like a cliche in all of these sci-fi uh, films that have this same type of plot. Mm-hmm. He thinks that uh, he can, um, you know, he and the girl should run off together and rule the world or something to that effect, right? Only I can show you how to unlock your power Mm -hmm. and that kind of Svengali relationship. Yeah, I don't really understand why he, like, does he want to, like, like, procreate with her? Or, like, what's the point? I don't... He just found what he thinks is the only other person who understands, or the only other person that understands him. I think that's it. Because right? been through so this does same he want to just like live with her? I, I don't her, think it's, weird it may not. Have, it may not. Have, I mean, there's that. I don't think it may have gotten past the fact that he just wants to like. I think he just wants to be one with her. You uh-huh. know what I mean? Like, he just wants to like meld with her at that point. Like, yeah. they can be one and be everything. Like, that's the line of thinking I think he's on. They'll have all of these interesting uh, conversations in their minds mm-hmm. and, while, as they explore beyond the black rainbow or whatever. Yeah. He says what that was at some point. That was basically the trip. Yeah. But uh, I mean, he's delusional, so I shouldn't be looking yeah. too much into it. I guess. Well, yeah. I think that's the that's kind of like the subtext of the movie is like that this whole idea that the '60s had that you know that you were gonna you know, save the world, you know, by everybody's going to broaden their, uh, their minds and all mm-hmm. this. And then like in the eighties, it's, you know, it's turned into everybody's drug addicts and <laughs> like, you know, everything's kind of turned inward and they're all very, you know, um, not psychotic or delusional, I suppose, but selfish. Yeah. You know, the me eighties, the me generation, I suppose. That's you, Colin. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> came out of there. No, I wasn't old enough at the time to actually be participating. I think you had to be in your teens to twenties to it, when that was actually going on. Um, here's, I guess, something that like I see with uh, these type of films that interests me, and I don't know. I mean, you, you have to tell me what you think about this, but um, I'm contrasting like uh, the film grammar of this versus something like, and I know we covered this on a show with another movie that everybody hated except for me was uh, <laughs> Only God Forgives. Uh, where <clears throat> you would have uh, like where these movies present like these series of shots and you have to <clears throat> kind of interpret what's happening in the film. Like uh, for instance, you see a guy standing in a doorway looking pensive. Then you see another guy across the street looking pensive. You know it's across the street because guy number one has looked at him at some point. And you're like, what the hell is going on here? Do they know each other? Is this guy waiting for that guy? What's happening? Then you cut to down the street, and there's a guy walking up the street. And these two guys who are standing here share an exchange of glance. They're waiting for this guy. Are they waiting to buy something off him, see something, what's happening? And the guy goes into a room, and they follow and beat the living shit out of him. So it's like you're processing... You know, you don't know when the the sequence starts, Mm -hmm. what's happening. And so it's like you're uh, intellectually trying to solve the sort out, like, what exactly is taking place. In this movie, they did this sequence, which is very abstract, where you see, like, once this guy goes into a big puddle of black goo, you see uh, these abstract scenes of... um, skulls melting you know smoke going out you know all this like flesh melting off of a skull uh smoke pouring into a skull that was the stuff that reminded me of dolly 
Yeah, because it's it's that dreamy surrealism. Surrealism, right? yeah. yeah. Surrealism only because, like, what? I mean, what? When you were watching that, what did that? What did that evoke? What did you think was happening there? Through these images, I mean, what was it, what was the movie telling you? What was happening? He was in his subconscious. That it was like a trip or something, right? Yeah. This wasn't actually happening in life. No. This was like a right. <clears throat> but that's like you know, I think that uh, you know, I guess maybe I'm trying to juxtapose two things that the just the film vocabulary, the having these shots cut together, like inspires this in you. Like you knew what was happening, right? You knew that this guy was having a trip, and then at the end of it, he comes out of the trip by actually coming out of the mm. big black puddle. Yeah. Or whatever. So it's like these mm -hmm. kind of, you know, they're using symbols to explain plot points in the movie. Yeah, you can fuse these things together, but that doesn't make you want to care about it. Well, that might be, that's, that's, that might, I don't know, that might be the, the trap you may fall into with surrealism. So well, and Colin, you said is. you watched this six times, right? Mm, I've and, seen it a bunch. Yeah. yeah, and we've all seen it exactly right. once. Yeah. So, yeah. well, there's, yeah, there's you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a, if, I mean, it's a film that if you are interested in it, would require study to kind of unwrap it, as it were. Because mm -hmm. well, I think the first time you watch it, I mean, like the first time I watched it, I was intrigued enough by it and enjoy the experience. I suppose more than. I don't know what would you say like uh I mean it's more of an experience right you yeah. it you, it somehow washes over you and then you say I'm intrigued I want to go back and watch that again because I want to have the experience again or not <laughs> but I mean you but you're, right. you're saying in order to to see you'd have to watch in order it multiple to keep times, going, yes. Is, you know, yes, yeah. yes yes in order to unlock those secrets should there be any and you want to go back and figure it out if there's anything to figure out just go back and just to see it again mm -hmm. I guess it's to experience it again well, is but is there anything in this film like deeper than the surface level? I mean, like if it is the you know we're saying it's, there's a story here and they're going and 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 telling like a simple story, I think, right? By extending the length of the the shots and the length of you know the pauses in between people talking and all this, so they're drawing it out at length. Mm -hmm. So it actually could be like told probably in like a twenty minute short film or something like that, right? I Indeed. Said, yes. I actually said that while you guys were outside. I was like, I wouldn't be surprised if this started out as a twenty minute short film. Yeah, I don't think that it did, but I think that he went straight. It wouldn't to surprise the, me if it feature. did, but yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um What is I guess okay, well going off of Michaela's idea that, you know, this is what I'm trying to feed back towards, is that, you know, if it's a, you know, an art installation, then that suggests that there's no um, like subtext or like a uh, an actual. Uh, so it's not Purpose. story, not plot. I would just say it's not bound to any of the rules of conventional filmmaking. Is what that means is that if it's an art installation, it's or even like a like a a, a human, um, you know what, like a. a human interest or like a human level yeah well just something to grab onto yeah because mm -hmm. if you like what do you know about the characters i mean is that like you know the way that you get into this is like if they don't have if the character doesn't have a lot of characterization mm -hmm. then you can't relate to them no there's no accessibility in this that's film. what i was gonna say it's yeah, like, it's not, yeah. it doesn't feel accessible, accessible about yes. it yeah 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 the people if nothing else there's, it doesn't feel accessible the only moment that felt kind of accessible was to, to me was when the nurse was looking at like the blueprints of what was happening to the experiments and she just had like a horrified look on her face that was the most like accessible human emotion mm -hmm. I felt I mean obviously you understand what the girl is going through she's kept as a prisoner but it's just yeah you don't really connect with her I was gonna say those two trailer trash dudes like drinking around the fire oh, yeah, at the I end. About that. I was like, that's the only movie. Like, I was like, this feels like a separate movie. It All does. of a sudden, yeah. it feels like a completely it separate movie because this is grounded. Yeah, and then, like nothing also, else in this movie is grounded. Also, because one of those actors was the only person I recognized in this movie. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. What is that guy's name? The chubby guy. Yeah. Um. I have seen fuck. him in things before. What's his name? He was. Oh God, I don't remember his name. I know he was in the show Eureka and like Once Upon a Time and. Uh, a couple movies. I've seen him in a lot of shit, actually. Yeah. 
I Mikaela's forgot. looking him up. I feel like it's Andre or something. It's like, I don't know. I'm probably way off. Yeah. I don't remember his name. <clears throat> well, I guess, you know, if we're talking about like, you know, there's this uh, idea of like art films versus like a mainstream film. Personally, I've always hated the term when people say like art films. I'm like, what does that mean? I don't know. You're automatic. I think you're automatically like telling people who wouldn't necessarily go see art films. You're already turning them off to it when not necessarily like maybe they should go explore stuff like this. Maybe not this one, but I think that's better than saying this is a film when it's really an art film and making people yeah. expect a conventional film. Yeah. You know, I feel like it's better to do it the other way I mean, around. That like does, yeah, that label mm-hmm. does have its advantages. <laughs> yeah, if you know, if you're not the person, just like ah, art films, no. Yeah, because I mean, if there is subtext in this, a I don't really know what it is, and b it's way too experimental for there to be like, I feel like at some point he had the filmmaker had to have been like, I want to get my point across, but instead he's like, I want to try this. You know what I mean? Like he put more effort into trying new things than to getting the story across. That guy's name is Chris Gothier. Oh, wow. He was in insomnia and Eureka and the watchman. Dude's had had quite a fucking career. Good for him. He's the guy at the newsstand. See the guy keeps coming by at the... I think movie? so. It says yeah. Seymour is the character's name. I'm not sure. Mm. No, but he's a series regular in Eureka, so yeah, good, he, good he for that cafe. guy. I loved that show. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> well, why does he go that direction? I know, like, she's got to have, like, our the... the she's got to have, like, a, a, a point, or at least she's got to, you know, she's trying to go somewhere she's trying to be out it feels like she's being subdued by the people around her mm-hmm. so she's got to go somewhere if she gets out and i suppose that's where you get the last part of this movie but like they said it, it feels of of uh separate well, turn into a slasher it. movie well, yeah, all of a sudden at the end like yeah. i get i get uh i get his motivations for wanting to are you saying the character the, the dr nile or the director yeah, no the dr nile i get his motivations for like killing the guys but like what is you know because obviously he thinks that there's he's after her and he thinks that anybody comes across is also after her so he kills them but why it, it turns into something different at that point I don't it, yeah it turns into a slasher movie I don't necessarily get why he went that route you could have cut like 20 minutes out of that point like maybe he doesn't even see those guys maybe he just ends up finding her outside of the thing I mean it just kind of adds I agree. Him coming across do. those guys did not need to be there. It's not necessary. I don't know what he's trying to say, like the lengths he'll go to get her and to to the how he's feeling that she is for him and he is for her and nobody else. I mean, I guess that it says that mm-hmm. like that's yeah, but where he, he's willing to go for it. But he can't, they kind of already got that point across when he willingly let the nurse die. He knew he, that she was going to do that. Yeah, I mean, he that watched his, it happen. You that know, was his little experiment right there. Yeah. Turn mm-hmm. the pyramid down and mm-hmm. see what happens. Mm-hmm. And... Well, the movie, like, you know, it's setting up this confrontation, right? If you have the Minotaur in the maze or whatever, Dr. Nile, right? He's mm-hmm. the bad guy. And you have Beauty in the maze. That's the the damsel. That's Alina, right? Mm-hmm. At some point, they're going to have to have a confrontation where you expect she's going to get the better of him and fight and win, right? And then or she do survives and, and do something. <clears throat> but the movie, like, so it gets you up to that point where he goes, he tracks her down, he kills these other guys that are just there, I think, to, you know, so... The, the director can scratch the itch of I got a slasher movie in there in there too. Oh, I hope he don't. In I my, hope he doesn't think he scratched that itch. Yeah, he didn't. Not I even really close. hope he doesn't think so. <laughs> but he might be satisfied. Right? Well, sure. He got but, a slasher well, movie. I think well, he's pretty for satisfied with himself for the most of this movie. Well, it, would, it would appear so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I'm saying when he gets them, he definitely to pat that, himself on the back for this one. He gets to that point where the two of them face off. He doesn't deliver on the expectation of, uh, you know, how these stories turn out. No. <clears throat> Unless you get it that she somehow used her telepathy to uh, cause Dr. Nell to fall down and crack his head, which I didn't. It seemed like he just got stuck in a branch yeah. and yeah. then tripped. Yeah. Because they didn't, they didn't have the effect of no. you know, the screen yeah, shit. Yeah. No, she didn't that. do that. And she very much had a, well, that's lucky look on her face, you know? Yeah. She mm-hmm. laughed at it. Yeah. She was just like, ha, ha, ha. Yeah. That's the way it turned out. Yeah. 
that does seem kind of, uh, I mean, I know you're saying oh, the whole movie, that might be the thing that like, I have an objection to is like, okay, if you're going to bring us to this point and then you're like, you know, that's basically the fuck you to the audience is like, look, we're going to do something new and clever. You expect this. And we're going to go this other way. That's the most movie-like mm, scene of this movie because it was such a ridiculous way for it to happen. Mm-hmm. The, that was the most movie-like moment of this entire movie. Mm. Like, the fact that this guy gets tripped up on a fucking branch and falls it over and like, dies. That's a movie it trope. It was like, like um, Lovely Bones. Yeah. Wasn't yeah, it? It, it was some, yeah. like, this doesn't really Fuck happen this way. Yeah. <laughs> she ends up escaping to what looks like a totally Spielbergian uh, sub- suburb. Yeah. I mean, all those houses. I'm sitting there going, "Are those the poltergeist houses?" That's what. That's kind of what it, it feels was. The like TV. Early. It was the flickering yeah, of the TV. Yeah, probably that gave me that But it looked like it was. A, it looked like she wandered up to a painting, really, like just a landscape of. But it almost. Felt I think like, it probably was. It almost yeah. felt like she escaped to because if you look at the houses, it's very um, like the manufactured houses. They're all uniform, they're all the same. like cookie all cutter. Yeah, back. It's almost escaping Little to boxes. that world. Like there was. <laughs> This world that she was in where there was the uniqueness to it, and then she escapes to the world that is just, I guess, ordinary. Like, that's where she's heading off to. It almost feels like, and there's almost literally a dividing line with the fence of, like, yeah. this world and that world. Uh, how she's choosing to go to this normal world over there rather than stay in this one. I, it feels but like it's trying to say. The by the way that it's set up where all the houses are identical and there's a television right, in every like, window. Yes, like, exactly. It's trading one... Thing one. for the other, and they're not necessarily any better. Any well, yeah, that's the thing. Like, yeah. there's the downside. One cage to that for as a well. new cage, kind of situation. Something like that. It's it feels like it's like it's cut right down the middle on that one. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know. If, I don't know if he was trying to say something with that, but I definitely got something out of that. She stops just before it, but yeah, there's that at the end. There's yeah. also the, the <laughs> sentient nut. I kind of dig the, the sentio nut or whatever run program sentio nut. Like there's a yeah. moment where she, after he dials back the the uh, the pyramid power. Yeah, mm, why is it always power. pyramids? I don't know what it's goes the, out with it's like the triangles. That, it's the angles, man. Yeah. It's always it's the, angles. the shape of the third eye and the Illuminati. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. The, it focuses it's that power. It focuses that power to the point. Is there the, you go. Is that what it is? Yeah. yeah. And then the smoke comes out, and yeah. But they run this uh, geometry. <laughs> <laughs> It runs Magic. this program the that is apparently the security uh, program for the installation. Which this is, I mean, I mean, it, I to me, I, I love this kind of stuff where it's like you have these movies where, like, yeah, okay, it's 1983 and we've got an installation. Okay, where's the installation? It's like got seven stories underground, secret installation. It's manned by these like autonomous, you know, robots that speak in uh, like modem code, like early aught modem yeah. code. <clears throat> and I think one of them plants a tracker in her mm-hmm. neck that's what and I then got. takes her back to the uh, the cell. So when she gets out, that's how he's able to track her. Mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. think one of them makes a phone, like a psychic phone call to him. Well, yeah, his phone's not plugged oh, in. Oh, was that the dial-up call? I think yeah, that was there's one there's no of, phone plugged in, so it's got to be psychic. Yeah, that was one of the sentient like <laughs> telling him that something was going on wacky. Uh-huh. Oh, that was when the, the the nurse had discovered his little um, his little stash of blue plant, yeah, blueprints. Yeah, yeah. It seriously sounded like dialing into AOL. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's very odd. The um, the movie, yes. <laughs> well, yeah, it is for sure. But that's what they're intending to do. Right? Yes, he's intending to do. See, this is where it's I'm, all purposeful. Yeah, it's purposeful. And what is their point? Well, this is where I think maybe coming back to because I think Michaela has does have a point about like the nature of this film and these types of films in general, right? Mm. Because if you're not like trying to draw some kind of uh, understanding of something of the human condition, right? Like basically, what it seems like he's doing is he saw a bunch of this Panos Cosmetos, mm-hmm. the director who apparently funded this movie with residuals from uh, Tombstone. Shut up. Like Why does Tombstone? he have residuals from Tombstone? His dad's dead. Uh, so he, he receives the checks. So not not the Cobra residuals? Apparently not. Oh, well, no, who knows maybe. what he's doing? Oh, you know what he's doing with that? His next movie <laughs> stars Nicolas Cage. Really? He hasn't made a movie since this, since uh, 2011. He's making one right now, and it's got Nicolas Cage in it. Okay, I'll, I'll go watch well, it. That doesn't, <laughs> mean, it's a, that doesn't <laughs> mean it's a good thing. I know, Nicolas yeah. Cage is in some of the worst movies of all time. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, but I guess, you know, I'm saying if you're, if you're just doing something that's like, okay, we're going to go and, you know, he's like seen all these films and being inspired by them. And that seems to be the primary thing that he wants to portray. Mm -hmm. He wants to capture the sense that he had as a young kid watching movies from this era. He's not really interested in the people in the story. Mm -mm. He wants to make it look feel sound and you know taste like a movie from 1983 this all started with like what like grindhouse and uh hobo with a shotgun it's like yeah. there's so many films now where it seems like people are trying to make movies that look like they were made you know these this is a forgotten film from mm -hmm. uh the, the you know certain eras of uh of filmmaking right. the lost skeleton enjoyed. of cadavera yeah. yeah right I enjoy them. I felt something for these. You will too, and I'll bring that. I'll try and bring that feeling back. Yeah, right. Is that a noble cause for making a film, or is it something that belongs on a museum wall? It shouldn't be the only cause for making a film. I think, and maybe for this one, it was the only cause. I don't know. It was a lot. I don't know. All right. Yeah. That might be what it is. <laughs> that, might be, that might be what it is. We can say that a lot for this movie. That might be what it is. Yeah. And we that, we just fine. looked up his Nicolas Cage movie. It's set in the exact same year as this movie. Yeah, 1983. Oh, he's got a hard on for 83. What's the I mean, appeal of 1983? It's the magic year, Colin. It was the year Stranger Things was set. 84. It? No, it was 84. And the sequel's in 85. 83 and 84 season. is... Because is... don't they have an Evil Dead poster in their room? Yeah, but they think Evil Dead came out in 81, but it actually didn't come out, come out until 80. That's a problem with Stranger Things. Yeah. The second they, one they, takes place yeah. in 84 because it's the year Ghostbusters came out. Oh, okay. But the, the first one was set in 83. This is set in 83. Everything that we see now that's like got these kind of like uh, the, uh, the nostalgia for mm -hmm. the 80s always seems to pick 1983. Is yeah. it because it's the year before 1984, the George Orwell? That's the famous that's 1980s the year. <laughs> year? <laughs> 1984. We're going to go one year earlier. I guess so. Was the early 80s uh, that much different from the later 80s? Are we getting are we getting two 90s with the later 80s? That yeah, the only, there's all the that early 80s that you get like... I think so, and I think that's why people stick with early 80s rather than... You never see anything like 87, 88, or 89. People don't go there if they're going to set a movie. It's always... Except it. Well, yeah. <laughs> Fine, Colin. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> it's usually early 80s. Yeah. That they stick with. But that's like, and the, the music is all from like that. I mean, I just saw Atomic Blonde. That does like the entire movie has a soundtrack from like the early 80s. Uh, you like Kung Fury, mm. you know, there's all these synthwave bands out there. You go through YouTube and you're looking and you see like all of these uh, neon kind of drenched uh, yeah. imagery that kind of looks like... Um, it looks like they're trying to, you know, look at Miami Vice. Everything's like purple and red, right? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Or blue, these neon colors. It looks like uh, Miami Vice or Scarface or something like Grand Theft Auto uh, 3. And then you go back and you actually look at Miami Vice. It doesn't look like that at all. Yeah. That's <laughs> what everybody's thought of it is. Yeah. We all, all seem to all remember people. the 80s having like this crazy neon all over the place. Right. But then you see people who are interpreting the 80s, and then you're taking your interpretation from that person's interpretation of the 80s, and it just all feeds back on itself. And then we have an image of the 80s that maybe isn't so representative of that time period. As it actually was, just how everybody remembers it. Are because people are interpret interpreting caricatures as the real thing, and then it just gets more blown up from there. Mm. A good example of that is like the first Grease movie. Well, I think it's a perfect film. It is a caricature of a of of the, the time of the fifties, yeah. and then the second one is a caricature of this original movie, which was already a caricature of this. So right. it just expands right. in a ridiculous way and just gets so blown out. I love Grease too. But I wonder, like, what's the deal? Like, I mean, the '80s seem to be like the the thing right now, where you know, in the 2000s or sorry, in the '90s, it seemed like everybody was trying to do things that looked like 19, the 1970s. Yeah. Right now, we're doing stuff that looks like the '80s. So I imagine Nostalgia the video lacks toaster 20 is years. coming back. Yeah, right. So you can get a, the jump on that. And make something now that just has video toaster shit like flying through the backgrounds of. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Allie McBeal logo. dancing yeah. baby. Yeah. <laughs> but all the colors in this, like all the reds and blues and stuff, is very jollo, I thought. Mm hmm. Because clearly he's. Which seen... I was like, Colin. <laughs> oh, yeah. Colin. I, see, I see everything that Colin likes in this movie. Mm hmm. Oh, yeah. 
Well, because I mean, maybe that's the thing. I dig the the you know, and when I'm watching and I see the movies that he got inspiration yeah. from, there's all these little like, oh, that's you know, you know, like I said, Blade Runner. That's Tron. That's uh, it's almost like these colors are like an actual taste for Colin. Like he can get a flavor out of it. And he's just licking, he <laughs> like, likes licking that popsicle. Like people read auras. He tastes yeah. the flavor. Did yeah. you taste the black rainbow cone? Did you taste the black rainbow? <laughs> and it was delicious. And he did. Because I just want to mix all colors together. The, that's a suicide. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's what it's called. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, what was I just read an article. They were talking about the two most prominent colors in movies is uh, like an amber and a blue light blue. Blue and orange. Yeah. Yep. They it say it's because, me. and once you see, once you see it, you can't unsee it because it's in like every movie. It's because the two most uh, photographed colors are human skin and the sky. And the sky. Mm-hmm. And so now they're just like punching those things up and making like you know this orange and this aqua blue everywhere. So the red and blue or red and green is like the antithesis of that? I don't know. I mean, you look at Atomic Blonde, it's like red and blue, the whole movie. Maybe they throw like a Doesn't green in together. there or something like that. Yeah. Primary colors. Yes. Well, so. now that we've had our commentary on primary colors, <laughs> have we reached a... Uh, <laughs> And you pass on the... Uh, the point at, uh, at which we go to the mailbag? I mean, I guess, so do we have anything else to say about beyond the Shit, black sorry. rainbow? <laughs> Holly just slams it. I'm, just, I'm all over the place. She's I'm like, sorry. fuck it, no. I'm sorry. I'm all over the place. Well, I mean, the only other thing would be, like, as we're exploring the idea of, like, what makes an art film, I was actually, like, thinking about this because I was wondering if that was going to be, like, what you guys are like, ah, it's, you know, it's an art movie, not a, uh, you know, like an actual movie or something like that. And I'm like, what is an art movie? You know, because uh, when I think of what is art, art is, you know, something that gives you a sense or a feeling more than it engages your intellect. Right. You go, you stand in front of a painting, you listen to a piece of music and you feel a certain way about it. It stirs up some kind of emotion. Mm hmm. I think art is whatever you interpret art to be. I think it's completely subjective. subjective so I don't think you can just put hard and fast rules on what is and isn't art. Yeah. So because it's yeah. almost like art is giving you like the it, the minimal amount of information is like presented to you, and you're, you're you do like, the rest of the work. And yeah, it's it's not yeah you're doing the rest of the work with yeah. and that's what this this movie feels like it's doing. But like, it feels like that's what art does. It's like here's this. It's very basic. I mean, art can be complicated, but it feels like it's very basic, and then you do the rest, and it has to be an emotional thing because it's just like, what is that doing for you? Mm-hmm. How is that making you feel? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it can. I don't think it's entirely not thought provoking. Oh no, it's it's. It, yeah. I mean, you you watch a ballet. I mean, well, there's that, a there's, lot. There's, I mean, but there's more to. I think there's more to a ballet. I I, I can't tell you the last ballet I've watched, yeah. but uh, really? I feel like there's more to I a like ballet. That. There's like there's more information in a ballet than like a uh, uh, Pollock painting hanging somewhere. That's just like colors and formation. Well, because even a ballet has like a story, right? Yeah, you know, and that's and most that's, do. They're yeah. not just it's 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 also it's got a purpose, and they're doing things on. It's not just purpose. a sensory experience. Right. They're not yeah. just out there doing whatever they want and improvising the dance and what have you. Unless it's an interpretive dance. <laughs> yeah. I mean, okay. <laughs> yeah. well, yeah. I mean, that's what it is, right? They're interpreting the music, right? Or interpreting I would story? say it's scripted. Is uh, pl- right. ballets are very scripted. Well, ballets are but even do the, the movement. Ballets are going to yeah, do the same thing. Yeah, that's all scripted and rehearsed. Time. Yeah, exactly. There's exactly. A, there's a, yeah. a flow to it as yeah. a purpose. There are moves, there are steps that they will follow every time they do it. Yeah. For the most part. Exactly. Yes. But I mean, I, I'm just saying, like, to come up with it the first time, right? You have to interpret the source. Right. I mean, you like, have a choreographer yeah, that's designing all that for yeah, you. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like, if you watch, if you watch Design. the, mm-hmm. if you watch the Russian ballet do Swan Lake, they're going to do it differently than the New York ballet. There's, but ba- they're telling the same story. There's yeah. basic moves that will be the same, but a lot of it will be different because it's different interpretation. But I think that's how all art is. I, th- I mean, it, it induces a feeling. But you're standing in front of it interpreting what the story is. You're still filling in those blanks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're taking that and being like, mm-hmm. yeah, like there's it's you're still invoking thought. Absolutely. Right. You're taking something and putting something back into it. It's a loop between you and our right. Colin, did you know that? It's <laughs> constant. <laughs> it's a loop. You look at it. It looks at you. Mm-hmm. There it is. Yeah. 
That's art. Well, I just assumed. I was I'm just glad we like, figured out art tonight. I, yeah. I was Very assuming because I was looking at like our uh, the closest art theater to us in Chicago. I went and I was like, so what's playing at like the art house? And it was like just an independent foreign film. And I'm like, this isn't really like necessarily an experimental, you know, art film. This is just a movie that like mainstream audiences wouldn't go see because it's about mm-hmm. yeah. people. You know, in like you know a realistic situation, right? It's just, people in 1848 <laughs> France. <laughs> no, it's like a modern thing. I think it's a movie called Columbus or something. Mm-hmm. Could, yeah, it's just like any, an indie film. It's just an indie film, but mm-hmm. they play the art house circuit, and yeah. so everybody thinks that like, oh, that's you know like an art film. I have to be you know of a certain frame of mind. I'm like, but it's still a movie. It's just yeah. about a subject that's only going to appeal to like a specific audience, I guess, at this point in time. In the seventies, it probably would have had a bigger deal, Robert. But, but there. All right. So anyway, but we digress. So is that uh, any other stray thoughts beyond the black rainbow before we summon our mailman and then do our final wrap ups? Which I can tell you right now, I I can place bets and I'm going to be 100 percent right. 100%. <laughs> See, this is the point where I'm just like, I loved it. Just to fuck with you. Uh-huh. <laughs> Sean's, but no. our wild, Sean's our wild card. You never know. <laughs> you never know. It's you never know. True. It's true. We do never card. know how this thing's going to turn out. Yeah. Screw you, it. Yeah. <laughs> Still on that. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, I think that's. Uh, I think we said our piece. All right. Shall we? I mean, we'll say more, more pieces. But as All right. Now. Stick around. Then, if you've hung with us this far, find God out what we actually you. thought uncensored of Beyond the Black Rainbow. But first, our mailbag and Igor bring us the mail. Masters, masters, the mail. I've got the mail. So many letters. Our followers are rising, rising. Why, well, thank you, Igor. Thanks, Igor. Nothing Sigur's, about how he Sigur's, shaved Sigur's, his head. Sigur's Nothing Sigur's about favorite movie. Did you know Tartags. that? He wears the same wig that this guy wore. I hope I he didn't use cousin, that wig glue. I Ugh. think his cousin is the baby looking. <laughs> Automaton that we saw later on. Mm-hmm. What the fuck was that? The sentient nut. Yeah. yeah, creepy face. They have faces. Of the what? Not what? The baby, baby face thing. Where it's just like. Tsh. But how do you know what that's like, called? Uh, the sentient. Did they ever not? say that? It's a run program sentient nut. And then Sentinot? somebody showed up and he's it's like, too much homework. Centaur nut. <laughs> 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 okay. What? Uh, first, Cinnabon. we should probably <laughs> let people know how they can write to us and tell us how much they despise Beyond the Black Rainbow. <laughs> there you go. How can they get a hold of us on Facebook? Facebook.com slash Saturday Night Freak Show. How about on Twitter? At Sat Freak Show. By email? Saturday Night Freak Show at Yahoo.com. And be sure to follow us on Instagram at Saturday Night Freak Show, where sometimes we give stuff away. Sometimes we do. Yep. You never yep. know. Uh, so about our movie, Beyond the Back Black Rainbow, tonight's movie, Anton Copsey writes in and says, this movie is totally underrated. I love this movie, and the soundtrack is phenomenal. What soundtrack? Talk it sounded like about. whales singing for like a good five minutes at the beginning there. Don't worry, Anton. You and I, mean, I, I have can't... the same opinion of the saying, sound mix on this. I like the soundtrack of this movie. I mean, I... It sounded well, like one note playing I, over I and over again for like a long the, uh, time. The Thing soundtrack, and it's just it is just musical. And it's just but there's way more to the Thing than there is to this soundtrack. This soundtrack is very bare bones. Just it like, is very bare bones, but there is... I can see why people would the, like... There's compositions in yeah. there that are Yeah, but cool they're just... Where, like, the, there's literally one note repeating over and over again over like five minutes of this movie. Yeah, I remember You're the sound of the the the, the drone. Oh, yeah, God, yeah. yeah. That yeah. sound. I'm gonna hear that forever now. Like <laughs> I'm gonna hear that in my <laughs> goddamn there was, only, there was only two scenes that I remember something slightly melodic being played. It was the one that all of a sudden it seemed like a music video when yeah. there was like a fog machine, and then at the very end, the end credits. The end credits. Then credits at the most rockin' yeah, song in the whole movie. Yeah, there were several. <laughs> uh, there were several through the movie, but you know, I mean, the, so there was like I think you know. Well, I was, was going to say there's a soundtrack album that'll probably have a bunch of tracks. I'm sure it's not just one long track. I don't know. Well, I we'll hope he. I hope he enjoys it. He <laughs> does. Uh, Rubber Monsters of Schlockland writes in and says, "Great name. It's yep. a fantastic film. It's visually brilliant and Sonoya Sino- Caves." We're trying to figure out how to say this. The soundtrack is amazing. Code Electro says, yes, awesome soundtrack. And RSH9 says, the soundtrack is insane. I love the tone. I don't even know. 
What? I no, like I, I watched a know. different movie. I'm glad you found the people. I saw Colin. the movie. Yeah, there you go. I'm so glad you're out there people. somewhere. Wow. <laughs> I'm glad there's a group of you. Yeah. I'm very happy for you. But it is kind of interesting to me that like pretty much everybody is like the soundtrack's great. That's yeah, it. But the movie. Can well, you imagine says, the music at well. these people's house parties? Oh my god. Yes, I can. It's all <laughs> carpet. Oh. Oh. It's like yeah. uh okay, about our episode on it. Okay. Which was last week's episode. Rushmore 309 says uh, about whether which one's the better one. He says that's an insanely hard question. The miniseries has a ton of nostalgic value to me, but in the grand scheme of things, I'd have to go with the 2017 version. Too bad we couldn't have Tim Curry in the new one. No disrespect to Skarsgård. He did an admirable job, but Pennywise will always be Tim Curry to me. Here's hoping 2018's Chapter 2 doesn't end with a big spider. I agree with yeah almost everything. He I, th- said. I mean, it's a shame that Tim Curry is in such poor health in general, you know, because you know, he yeah. showed up for that Rocky Horror thing for like a brief cameo, yeah. and that was re- seemed like it took the life out of him to do that. Uh, so yeah. it'd you be know. great if they could have done variations of Pennywise like throughout the movie. Ooh, that would have been Tim cool. Curry would have been one of them, and then cha- and that would have been the only part, and then it changed, and then changed again, and like got to Scar's Guard awesome. as it. That'd been good. That, oh, that would been, been so cool. Pennywise yeah. would have been cool. That could have been cool. That'd have been all right. Mm-hmm. You did, did we mention the uh, original Pennywise cameo in it? Yeah, there's like a little clown doll in that room where, where uh, Richie. Yeah. Well, I don't think in. we mentioned it because everyone saw it. Yeah, there, there we go. Uh, people saw it in the trailer. People saw it in the trailer. Yeah. Yeah. there is. Yeah, it would have been cool though if they could have just put even even put Tim Curry in as like the pharmacist or something. You know, just like sneak him in as like a cameo. Is role, that is know? that too much though? Because there's a lot of other movies that do that where they just it stick depends those on how it's done in there. Uh, depends on, it how, depends it's on how it's done. Like the Ghostbusters remake, where they just kind of oh, Jesus, oh God, don't. we're not. I, know, we're not. I, w- I wish they yeah. would stop doing that. I mean, either, I, either way, saying, like, don't we get to, enough of it? It has to be subtle. Like, it can't be pointed. Because, yeah. Yeah. If I was Johnny in the Depp theater in uh, Twenty One Jump Street, that was us. That one, right? okay, that, that made sense. <laughs> that was pretty good. Either way, Tim Curry is in too poor of health, so it wasn't going to happen. Yeah, exactly. But what else? All right. Well, about our near dark episode, Tony Genoway writes in and says, "I just heard you guys mention my comment about the world on Blood Vampire Novel." And I dislike the melodramatic vampire stuff also, and I don't recall it being that way, but admittedly, it's been many years since I read it. Oh, well. Cool It podcast, regardless. Cheers. Hey, thanks. Thanks, hey, man. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. That's mail. Well, that's the mail. So now we're going to go around the room and review Beyond the Black Rainbow. I can't wait to hear this. <laughs> Starting with... Sean! What did you think <sighs> you of Beyond the, the Black Rainbow? Yell? Why? Why does... I don't yell. Why are you yelling at me? Oh, sweetie. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, uh, beyond the black rainbow. Uh, it's. Uh, I mean, like we, like Colin said, it's funny that everyone mentions the soundtrack, and I'm looking at all the poll quotes on the front and back of this Blu-ray, and it's. Uh, it says things like uh, vividly imaginative, absolute stellar, mind-blowing visuals, uh, gorgeous, perplexing wonders, truly unforgettable, a visual trip, hypnotic. It all seems to base itself on the visuals, which I will say, there is sensory. It's it's very sensory. The visuals are the part I liked about this movie. There's um, the cinematography. I think is the uh, I think the I mean, it might be the only part I liked about this movie. But I like like whatever the the macro lens that they use to get those close up shots of all of all the objects in this movie. I really like that. It remind uh, remind me of something else, and I, I can't remember it. There was some I, I think maybe it was early like Fincher stuff. He did some macro stuff and maybe seven some other things, but. Not, not to the extent this movie does it, but I really like what they did with that. Um, some good visuals in this, and it really does feel like a movie from like the '80s. So uh, I commend them on their visuals. Um, it, I mean, but I think that's the biggest thing this movie has going for it. Um, it's not whether it was meant to be or not. It's not accessible for me. Uh, I guess as a story, um, it doesn't do much for me in that regard. The soundtrack is, uh, eh, you know, it's. It's the soundtrack. I've heard similar things like that, so it doesn't like stand out to me. Um, I guess the best part about this was the visuals. Uh, story did nothing for me. Um, it's a little too long. Uh, I don't recommend it. It doesn't. It does feel just like an art, an art piece, an art installation, but it's not. It didn't grab me or it didn't like do anything for me. It didn't push any of my buttons. It didn't. There's no hook for me to bring me into this film. Uh, not accessible for me. I pass on Beyond the Black Rainbow. 
Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> this movie was not for me. No. Uh, yeah. At best, this was a colorful movie. Uh, some of the shots had an artistic sense. Wow, I've um, never, <laughs> I've never heard so much like acid on a thing, like an artistic <laughs> sense, maybe. Well, because all art is subjective, and just because it's you don't, true. just because you don't like art doesn't mean it's not art. It's um, true. It's so true. yeah, it had an artistic sense. And just because it you was, don't like it doesn't mean you don't like art. Exactly. Right, exactly. Like it was very, exactly. yeah. It was just co- because you like it doesn't make it art either. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let's just cover it all right there. Yeah. What is all art? those things are true. Yeah. Let's, yeah, just, what, what is, is art? art? What is art? He backs away from the microphone and walks out of the house. <laughs> what is what art? Is art? <laughs> what is art? Who decides it's art? That's it. Yeah, no. Um, this movie was boring as hell. It was pretentious as fuck, and I hated it. Giant pass, Michaela. Uh, all right. So, as a former art major, I have watched many, many, many hundreds of hours of art film. And they all have one thing in common, and it's their pretension and their inaccessibility. They want to keep the viewer at arm's distance. I don't know why, but that's they feel like that's the only way to make an art film, is to keep people away from Do it. Do they want to, or is that just a uh, an is outcome of making art? Is it the byproduct of making art? I think it's... Is that you I think keep it's some a, people at it's, distance? Because they're, they're experimenting, and they're not thinking yeah. about anything else but trying something new. Exactly. They're trying to experiment, yeah. and they're trying to not make it a typical film. So how do you not make it a typical film? You alienate your viewer and push them away. Right, I mean, but are they like they're trying to do the things you say like, yeah. to not make a typical film and all that stuff? Yeah. But are they actually trying to alienate people? Or, or I don't they think just, so. They I think that's just how it ends up. If they do, they're just like, I'm, yeah, yeah, that's just yeah. how it ends up. They yeah, have a singular vision, yeah, and that's yeah. what they want. Like, well, yeah, and that's bad, how so. it ends up. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a. I, I was telling Holly off Mike. Um, there's an artist by the name of Matthew Barney who is married to Bjork, who is a visual oh, yeah. video artist. And he has made a series of movies, five movies called The Craymaster Cycle. Uh, that is 398 minutes, and I've seen all of it. And it is nonsensical, absurd, weird stuff all strung together. Um, and, yeah, I've seen it all. I, I just feel like I've seen all this kind of stuff before. I don't ever need to see any more. Um, I don't get anything out of watching it. Uh, I felt like this movie... From the beginning, Holly and I were talking to Mike about this, like felt like that scene in She's All That where they go to the interpretive art night. <laughs> and that scene in She's All That is just a bunch of random weird shit strung together on stage. And like Freddie Prince Jr. just kind of like uh, don't really know how to react to this. And uh, I just it's it's so far from like a mainstream film. But that doesn't necessarily make it bad or good. But this movie's just inaccessible and it's. It doesn't seem to have a point or a payoff to anything it's trying to do. And, like, the soundtrack is... I mean, I've heard better versions of what the soundtrack does in a lot of other movies. I think there's a lot of better options out there if you want a quote-unquote trippy movie. Uh, so I definitely... I just would not recommend it. Question. Mm-hmm. Uh, you say you've seen uh, a lot of these. Like you said, you watched yeah. all whatever... The Craymaster uh, cycle? Yeah, the Craymaster Which the Craymaster is, is a muscle in your testicles, so that's what that's named after. I am- so. In. I will watch <laughs> yeah. 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 just based on that. Yeah. I'm like, how do you get that much? Uh, Bjork's husband. Out of this? Can you imagine how weird Bjork's husband did probably right. is. Yeah. Oh, I'm, yeah. All right. I'm down for yeah. that. I'll see you guys uh, next week and give you a full review on that. Um, but do you ever, my, my question was, do you ever think that you would find uh, something, a, a piece of, I'll say art, like this, like something that Colin likes or something like mm-hmm. that, that does like hit the spot for you. Do you think? Oh, I'm sure it's out there. Yeah. yeah. I'm open to it for sure. I just, this movie, You're like. not going to pursue the, it to find it. You're just the, like. It'll find me. <laughs> you know? All right. I like that. That's a good answer. That's a good answer. I like yeah. that. That's yeah, all right. Because I'm, I'm not really all that interested in Terrence Malick movies. Yeah, but me right. neither. I, I don't either. the same kind of thing, but with heavy drama. But yeah. when you're talking right. about like horror, sci-fi, like, I think maybe this is the thing. I, like, I think I experience things through, like, a visual, like, the visual medium is my gateway. Like, and I think that's why it appeals to me. I sit there watching this movie, and like I was describing it earlier, it's, you're sitting there, and an experience is washing over you. It's an experience more than it's a, uh, like, I'm paying attention to a narrative. Right. Like you do in most films, you sit down, there's a narrative, there's moments of excitement, there's moments of uh, emotion, there's moments of, you know, uh, this movie isn't going for any of that. I think it is a fetish object in a way, you know, I'm not saying that there's anything necessarily wrong with that. 
uh, because I think, you know, cinema is like that kind of envelope or umbrella where basically it can hold, you know, on one side the, uh, the formula movie and on the other side it can hold the experimental thing. They're both talking in the same language, I guess, and that's what I think makes it confusing to a lot of people who goes in like this movie mother is out now in theaters and people are going to see it and just rejecting it. You know, like they just don't like it because they're expecting a movie that's told in you're in a theater. This is how movies function. And when you don't see that, I think there's, there's like the sense that the contract between the audience member and the filmmakers has been violated somehow. Or they might just hate it. <laughs> yeah, but I think... Because the contract was violated. Yeah, because the contract's been violated. In some cases, I've heard, maybe not you specifically, but I mean, a lot of the stuff I'm hearing about that film, you know, is is kind of that way. And I've talked to people who've had similar experiences with other things where, you know, other non-mainstream movies where, you know, uh, they just say, like, you know, I just don't like this because of its form. Um, there's other people I think, you know, that, uh, me included who like it because of the form, because it's something that's, um, that somehow talks to you or speaks to you. i see a lot of other, you know, horror films that, you know, try to be, um, experimental and they don't work. Uh, I think I get Panos Cosmatos's vibe here because, you know, I'm into the same kind of things I think that he's in and can recognize the influences and, you know, you sit there kind of, you know, it's a, it is like a nostalgia trip. I guess that for me, that's why I'm saying this is a nostalgia movie. I get that it is coming from a filmmaker who's, tr- that's what he's trying to make. Specifically, he wants to have been alive in 1983. I don't know when he was born, but I'm guessing that he wasn't alive then. And, but he saw all these uh, movies and wants to make a movie like he was in that uh, point in time. Uh, I do think that the soundtrack. You know, we're talking about like both the score, uh, the electronic score, uh, and the um, sound design are interlinked. I'm not sure if the same guy did both, uh, but I think there is like something to the tone and the mood, the atmosphere that's created by the the sound, uh, making you uncomfortable or making you, you know, I think that's its intention, and I think it's kind of cool, um, especially. You know, I do like some of the melodic stuff that they do in this movie. I mean, I'm kind of into that genre right now. So this is, you know, the synth wave or whatever. So I've been exploring that on my own. But, um, yeah, I think as a collective package, it's like you can't obviously go and recommend this to everybody. And I am sorry that I brought this tonight. Right? <laughs> I mean, like in, I guess in my mind, I'm like, well, you know, we watch all these other things. and We're like explorers in movies. We watch terrible fucking movies. Uh, we watch good movies, and I'm like, well, let's watch something you know like this. So we're not having the, uh, a similar conversation <laughs> sure. to what we've had that makes several sense. other times. It was, but a, you're, but it was a different conversation. Today. There you yeah. go, and that's <laughs> yeah. And if was, you're still sure. with us, right? There's uh, legitimacy thank you to that, but also you're in your own ship at a different part of the world. Uh, yeah, and yeah, yeah, nobody's ever explored. I, I feel like that all the time, Sean. It's like the stuff I watch. Right, you're like, look, look over there. There's thank land. God for the let's internet. Let's go to that. Um, but yeah, so. Uh, so if like me, you we like are this Water kind of World, stuff. you're the only one that has yeah. seen Dry Land. The only one that, yeah. <laughs> Check out Beyond our Water World episode. <laughs> Beyond the Black Rainbow, as it were. So uh, yeah, I would also recommend a movie called Evolution, which I was thinking about bringing, but no, no I'm Sean not William going Scott? to. What was yeah. William Scott? No. Oh, <laughs> no. This and Orlando it's a, Jones. Oh, it's a on. French movie with a Lovecraftian oh, okay. overtone, right, but fine. it's again a lot. I was of, like, Evolution's uh, hilarious. <laughs> sing, <laughs> sing, rub some no, punk sing. on it. <laughs> <laughs> so I would definitely, absolutely, if you've listened so far, and yeah. you're kind of you're intrigued. You're like, <laughs> you are Colin. Huh, I got to follow along at home with the Saturday Night Freak Show, and you know, am I going to do? Yes, you got to watch uh, Beyond the Black Rainbow. You got to be patient with it. Maybe you want to take something, you know, to help the experience I along. Would You'll at it. least need to take some caffeine, Colin. I don't think so. I, I, <laughs> like I said, my experience, I was awake the entire way, just kind of. And I think that's the other thing. It's like it engages your, I guess this is why I like this type of movie. It's the same reason I like Mother, actually. Uh, the It engages my mind while I'm watching it in a different way than I'm usually engaged by a movie, mm. you know, and I it stays with mother. you in some way after, you know, it's like, well, yeah, I saw that movie. Was it good? Yeah, it was good. Okay. But these ones, you're like, 
you know, I got to go back and watch that again. You know, either I didn't understand it or I, you know, want to find out more about this or I want to have that experience again. And so you keep going back to them. These are the types of movies that I watch multiple times. You know, you see something else, you know, once you're like, okay, I'm good. And these ones I keep rewatching. So I don't know how many times I've seen Only God Forgives. I couldn't even tell you. It'd probably be embarrassing. So many, so many times (laughs) you've seen it. Yep. Which reminds me, I got to go watch the Neon Demon again, but. Uh, no, you're gonna let me borrow that one. That would be an absolute recommend for Beyond the Black Rainbow. Uh, next week we're gonna be watching a movie that's chosen by Holly. No, 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 Sean. Sean. No, are we (laughs) off? It's you, it's you, me. Yes, it's you because you threw everything off last cycle. Yeah, Yeah. it's you. Oh my god, he doesn't know what Sean is. No, it's Sean, and it's also our first Halloween episode of the month of October. Sean, what are we watching? <laughs> Do we need to give you a moment? Yes, please. All right, so now we're going to play a game of catchphrase. Oh, you know, we're, Michaela and I were talking. What are our freak show fans called? Yeah. What guys, are, guys name yourself. What do, we need a name for that. Yeah. Oh, that's very what, true. What do you guys want to be called? Yeah. You know, like, tell us what you want to be called. Yeah, because we're the... I guess for the like, there's there's one podcast that listens. We're to the freaks. There's one podcast that listens. To it's like true crime stuff, and they call their fans the Murderinos, mm-hmm. yep. and I think that's hilarious. I was like, we need a we need a fan name. Freak show. Yeah. I mean, because I are we the, we're the we're the freaks, aren't we? We're the freaks. We're the freaks. Wait, you can't be participating in this. You need to be thinking. You need to be thinking. Think about your movie. Damn it. I mean, like, I, there's, oh, you know, there's... You didn't fingers. ask earlier, and this is what happens well, when I you don't I ask. down, obviously. <laughs> God damn it. I was this like, is, no, it's not. I suppose it doesn't matter, okay. because it'll be on Facebook before this episode airs. <laughs> I got it. Oh, Sean, go. what are we watching? Our first Halloween episode? For our first Halloween episode, we're going to go to vampires, we're going to go to werewolves, we're going to do all that shit. We're going to watch Fright Night Part 2. All right, that's all right, next all week. Right. Fright Night Part Two from the director of the miniseries of it. Oh yeah, it just God, is the movie it is that keeps Tommy on giving. Wallace yeah, Tommy Lee Wallace. Just, uh, that's two in a row. Shit. All right. All right. Well, that is next week. We hope you'll join us. Thank you for sticking around. <laughs> yeah, after that one of, yeah. one of you who are left. Uh, I and promise it was then, more their fault than mine. I don't know why. Oh wow. I just feel okay. like it is. <laughs> I'm gonna hear Sean it. Sean doesn't one. take responsibility. Mm-hmm. It's our job Not to keep you in line. All Thank of a sudden, you. I appreciate it. All right. Well, until then. The basement is going dark.